Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so this is a new format of what is, in crypto years, an old tradition, which is the three of us discussing uh, what the future of crypto's architecture, uh, resource distribution, value capture, and those kinds of things will look like. Um, when Brad's not at USV, he's at Placeholder um, debating these things with us. And so uh, to launch into things, I want to ask Joel, uh, who originated the FAT Protocols thesis in his time at USV, uh, which many of you know underlay the, many of the narratives of the 2017 uh, boom, uh, what was the original FAT Protocols thesis? So the way that came about, um, for a little bit of context, I had joined Union Square Ventures in 2014, and um, what we were seeing at the time is that it was becoming increasingly difficult to be a venture capitalist on the web because we were seeing Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and other big web companies consolidate the web ecosystem much in the same way that we had seen Microsoft consolidate the, the, their previous market and IBM back in the hardware era. And so we started to look for other areas, other places of innovation and activity where um, applications could be more competitive with the web incumbents. And we kept bumping into blockchains and crypto. And the thing that, that uh, seemed so stark about the difference between blockchains and, and web services was uh, where the data was. And so on the web, all the data lived with the applications. And so all of the defensibility lived with the applications. On crypto, we were finding that all the data was in the protocols. And so all of that value uh, was locked in the protocols. And following that observation is what led us to understand that uh, if the data, if the value is in the protocol layer, then these are fatter protocols in terms of how much value is captured at that layer relative to the web's protocols, which have no data around them. Um, Whereas the applications uh, are much thinner in terms of the functionality that they provide or how much of the work they end up doing to perform the service because the data and the service is produced by the protocols. Right. Um, so that was the observation that, that led us to this conclusion. Got it. Um, and Brad, what struck you? I mean, I'm sure having watched our own processes, ideas get uh, co-created and uh, smoothed over with time. What struck you as FAT Protocols was coming to life as an idea? Well, the, um, you know, the, the way I started thinking about this was thinking about the experience that we had with Tumblr, uh, where when we first met David Karp at USV, he had, he had four employees and 20 million users. And it was a really hard thing for me to wrap my head around because it, I, my experience historically had been that it took a lot more resources to build a network of that size. And when we started to, to dissect it, um, it became clear that the difference was that they, you know, they were able to create a global communications network without paying for any of the communications because all of us had agreed to pay 10 bucks a month to AOL or some other internet service provider. So we individually were funding access to this common infrastructure so they could build an application on top of that infrastructure that was very thin. Um, and so with a very small number of people, they were able to create a, uh, an application that encouraged, obviously, all of the content to be created by, the, uh, by all of the participants and the users in that network. What happened over time is that as that network continued to exist, they started to accumulate a lot of data. And their S3 bill went right through the roof. Um, and all of a sudden, they had to raise a ton of money in order to be able just to support the infrastructure that they were now uh, operating in order to continue to provide the service. And in doing that, they eventually had to sort of figure out what the business model was, and ultimately they came to the model that we're all so familiar with, which is essentially surveillance capitalism, um, and you know, turning the users into product and, and selling advertising. Um, and so what's so interesting to me about FAT protocols is, as Joel says, we're, we're, taking, we're separating the data from the application. In the same way that Tumblr separated communication from the application, we're now separating the data from the application. Um, and there are two possibilities. One is that the data is embedded in the protocol. That's our experience with Bitcoin, where there's an incentive for 400,000 miners around the world to store the data uh, without 
any, anybody else. And you can think of applications layer services like Coinbase riding on top of that and not paying for any of that data infrastructure. Or there's a possibility that we will all individually have personal data stores in the same way that all of us paid for internet access, all of us may pay to, to have a personal data store. And so the application on top will be that much thinner. It will be able to operate without actually paying for any of the data costs or any of the communication costs. And so we have started to see early implementations of this. Uh, we have the good fortune of working with a small team of, I think of them as kids, um, out of Russia and the Ukraine who've built an application called Zerion. Um, and again, they, they, they built an application, a very lightweight application, got to a large number of users with a very small team because now they're not paying for either the communication or the data. So I'm gonna come back to you on Tumblr and user data stores, but before I do, um, FAT protocols has become so popular that there are now the people, there are now the lovers and there are now the haters. And I'm curious, um, from your perspective, Joel, what are the ways in which you see the FAT protocols thesis most commonly being misinterpreted? Well, the most common, um, I think, confusion has to do with conflating value capture with investment returns, which are two very different things. And so FAT protocols is an observation about where value accrues over time in the structure of this market across the kind of value chain of crypto versus investment returns, which is a more complicated function of things like what your cost basis is, what growth rates are, what your ownership percentage concentration is. And so I think when um, some people read or uh, hear the argument that there's more value captured at the protocol layer, they assume that there's more investment returns available at the protocol layer when that is a much more nuanced um, kind of output or, or return. Um, one of the things that is also kind of a, an interesting nuance in terms of how value works across both of those is that uh, the protocol layer, as we know, is, is largely networks, not companies. And so uh, networks accrue and distribute value in very different ways than companies do. And at the application layer, we tend to have companies more than anything else. Um, and so the, the market forces that drive value and returns across those two layers are very different and need to be treated and invested against in, in isolation. Um, I think where we are now, there's uh, investment returns available across both layers. I, I think there's, we see plenty of opportunities both at the protocol layer, at the application layer. Within, we're investing in both, in both layers ourselves. Um, long term, we may end up in a place where a lot of the value is concentrated in the protocols, um, but the returns may go away and go to the applications or go elsewhere to another market and still have a lot of value captured in that ecosystem. The analogy I like to use, if you think of infrastructure in the physical realm, like utilities or even internet access infrastructure, there's a lot of value captured in kind of the balance sheet of that layer uh, of the economy, but it otherwise kind of grows or accrues value in, at a normal pace. Um, so I think that confusion of mistaking value capture with investment returns can lead to misallocation of capital um, in, in ways that is um, suboptimal, I'll say. I, I think it was Warren Buffett, or I'll attribute it to him because it's easy to do, that said um, a good company can be a bad investment yeah. at the wrong price. Yeah. Um, and we've seen a fair amount of that in the crypto space. Certainly there's been a correction since 2017. Um, but speaking of good investors, um, Brad, your first fund at USV with Fred Wilson uh, returned 14x um, and was one of the best venture funds of all time. But one thing that I find fascinating is in conversations with you, uh, it wasn't so clear in 2003, 2004 when you guys were fundraising of how these network-based businesses were gonna make money. Um, and so I'm curious what the experience of uh, getting USV off the ground was, and then at what point you realized, oh my God, these applications are gonna be really fat. So, um, you know, one of the funny things about being in the venture capital business is that um, people sort of assume that you're in the business of handing out money and they forget that at some point you had to go ask for money. Um, and when Fred and I went out in 2003 for the first time to raise a fund, 
It took us 80 meetings and a year. Um, people fell asleep on us. People walked out on us. People were incredibly rude. Um, eight zero. 80. Eight zero, eight zero, yeah. And um, the challenge was that we were advocating an investment thesis that said we're going to invest at the applications layer of the web in 2003 when the limited partner community, the people that invest in venture funds, were still digging out from under all of the new funds that they had done in the 99 time frame. Um, and you know, so the idea of backing uh, two people who hadn't worked before with a thesis that was going back into the same place where people had lost money in 99 and 2000 um, was really difficult. But what, what happened after that is that you know, we actually, once we got the fund raised and we went into the market and we started investing in networks at a time, and the applications layer of the web, at a time when most VCs were sort of retreating back to chips and routers and hard technology, we kind of, we had an open field. And so, you know, the, I, I think of it as being, you know, I mean, I'm not sure you can create a direct analogy with crypto and sort of think beyond, you know, the, the bubble in 17 and the, you know, the, you know it's not, we, we didn't have a crash the way the crash in 2000 was. There's still um, interest, but, um, but I think that, you know, the real investment opportunities happen when things are out of favor, not when they're in favor. And that's, I think, what, what drove the returns on that fund. And so is there any advice you would give to investors or entrepreneurs right now in the crypto phase, uh, space when things are out of favor? Um, well, I'm, obviously I'm a huge believer uh, in the space. Uh, I start from the premise that I'm a believer in decentralized, emergent, bottom-up startup innovation. And I think we're in an era of consolidation around what I think of as the data monopolies on the web. And if an open public communications medium was the key that unlocked innovation on the, you know, in, in the media industry when, when the internet came out, I think open public data stores will unlock uh, another kind of Cambrian explosion of innovation because you know, if you can separate the data from the application, if you can unlock the market power associated with the exclusive control over that data set, I think it's an enormous opportunity. I think it's a profound tra transforming opportunity. Um, and so do I have advice other than stay with it? No. That's... Well, we're, we're staying with it. That's why we raised the 10-year venture fund. Um, can you? We have to stay with it. We have to stay with it. Um, we're excited to stay with it. Um, can you unpack a little bit more, Joel, what Brad is uh, referencing there with data monopolies? It's something that we talk about a lot at Placeholder of how blockchains as open data stores um, open up the uh, arena for innovation upon that data. Yeah. The. Um it was a real mind blower for us when we realized that in crypto, you basically bring your own data to a service or to an application, whereas on the web, you kind of go to the application to get your data. And if you think about that setup, um, we've ended up with these data monopolies, um, largely Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, which have the tendency to um, expand their platforms at the expense of little startups. And so we've all seen over the time that we've been working in technology how startups come and go and Google kind of either buys them or absorbs the functionality or copies them. And it's not just Google, obviously, Facebook and Amazon and all these platforms, they tend to expand uh, their functionality. Um, and then as we, as we already talked about, then they also um, gather a whole bunch of data as a result of that. And so they're able to uh, produce really highly sophisticated information services based on the data that they're able to collect about you, but otherwise don't really have visibility into your full data set as a human being. So uh, Google has a bunch of information about um, your communications and what you're searching for and things like that. Uh, they don't have your Amazon purchase history, for example, and don't have other data sets that could make that even more valuable. At the same time, we kind of don't want them to have all this information as these big companies have gone from uh, fun startups that we like to associate with to institutions that we're afraid of. And so the, the idea of having them collect even more data and, and uh, share it is, is also a little scary. And so um, we have now this kind of market failure where each one of those uh, silos or monopolies has 
uh, is not really incentivized to make their data interoperable because their entire business is based off of it being proprietary. Um, and so they don't want you to take your data with you in quite the same way. Um, and at the same time, then we're unable to capture the full value of our information because it's segregated across so many different platforms. Um, and so you have this, this, this dynamic now on the web, and then it's, it's made worse by um, data becoming increasingly a liability and a cost center as the risks of cybersecurity increase and the costs of regulation around control over data also increase. Um, and that has the side effect of actually entrenching the incumbent interests because Google can afford to comply with the new data regulations in, in the EU, but a tiny little startup can't necessarily do that. Um, on crypto, it's the complete opposite because you have all the relevant information that you need at the protocol layer. Uh, the user is now responsible for their data security when you're dealing with a public-private key system. And uh, we're basically taking the things that we've learned about uh, Bitcoin and these financial systems that we've created and extrapolating it out to information services as a whole. Um, you have this system where the, the data is in the networks themselves. The user basically manages a series of keys that authorize third-party applications to access and interact that data. And now, all of a sudden, instead of you going to Google to get a copy of your data uh, or to interact with your data where that's the only place where you can interact with it, in crypto, you can interact with services from a variety of interfaces. You're not locked into any of them. So what happens is when I go to Zerion, for example, which is uh, the, the thin application that Brad was talking about, um, it's essentially a crypto bank without a bank because they've taken all the decentralized finance protocols, put them all together in a single interface, and can give you the same features as uh, a bank or Robinhood or SoFi, but they didn't have to build any of the underlying functionality or data or liquidity to be able to do that. When I go to Zerion and I authenticate to Zerion, I'm giving, giving them the keys for them to go find my maker loan and for them to go find my Ethereum transactions and for them to go find my trades and present that information. I've, I came to Zerion with my data already as opposed to building all of that data with, within an application and then being able, unable to right. leave. And so when you look at, at that setup and then you start to think about how we can take that paradigm further into information services, you start to see how we deleverage applications because they no longer control all of that information. And that was really the thing that made us realize that uh, this is a fundamental transformation in the, in the structure of information services. We're seeing it first with crypto and DeFi type protocols, but as the infrastructure becomes more mature, then we're gonna yeah. see this model expand to other applications. And it's, um, this idea is one, was one of the core tenets to raising uh, Placeholder's first fund in 2017. So if you guys are interested in um, getting a bit more background on this trend in the context of information technology over the last 50 years, um, it's there in Placeholder's thesis from 2017. Um, Brad, you have been thinking about user-centric data stores for a long time and searching for um, your uh, insight generation engine that will bring you uh, all the information that you desire as opposed to you having to go find it on the um, big World Wide Web. I'm curious what your hopes are um, for user-centric services on the web going forward. Well, Joel did, a, I think, a very good job of describing the, the fundamental shift between, you know, a, a world in which the data is embedded in the platforms and you go to a platform and the platform essentially has exclusive control over your data on their, their platform and um, it's siloed. So you interact with multiple platforms and each of those platforms has an incomplete view of you. Um, I'm, you know, I, I think, you know, my, my dream is, I, I mean, I, I say this not entirely in jest, but I, I'd like to key log myself. I'd like to capture all of the data that I create as I interact with services, and I'd like to capture that data on the way out before it gets encrypted by an application, before it gets embedded in some uh, server someplace, and I'd like to create my own data store. And with that data store, I mean, you guys, anyone who's at all technical out there understands how many issues there are associated with what I've just proposed. But, um, but in concept, if I had a, a data store that was complete, 
One of, the, one of the great frustrations I have on the web is if I go search for a set of skis one evening on Google um, and then I buy the skis the same night, I still get targeted for the next month to buy skis from you know, all the retargeting engines that used my Google data but didn't see the transaction. So I, I just like to share the transaction, say don't, don't, don't hit me with that one, but um, <laughs> hit me with something else. And so if I had com a com comprehensive user data store that compiled information from all of the interactions across the web, and I permissioned that out to service providers, I could imagine a world emerging where there were a larger number of smaller specialized services. Think about um, AI engines that did very highly specialized things, working ag against that data set and then providing services to me, working for me, working on my behalf. One of those services that Chris referenced would be um, just a newsreader, but a newsreader that actually had the benefit of knowing everything that I'd already consumed. Um, and so didn't show me dupes, didn't show me stuff that I already read, actually potentially was able to do some natural language processing and some sentiment analysis to figure out that this is the one insight in this new article that you haven't read before that you should pay attention to because everything else you've already read. It might not be a dupe, but you've already read something like it. And so this is the one new idea. Pop that for me. So I think there are a set of personalization services that are coming our way in a world where we have control over a data set that we haven't even begun to think about. I mean, I'm, I, you know, the, the newsreader is one. I think a product feed is, an, is another one. It completely changes our concept of advertising if, if what I have is a permissioned data set that is actually producing for me a set of recommendations that I'm interacting with on my, on my terms, not as a result of being bombarded with advertising. Yeah, there's an important, uh, a super important point embedded there, which is um, this only works if we are in control of the data and the people who are providing that service are not in control of the data. Because where we live in now is that Facebook is in control of the data and then they decide how to present it to you. And so they're, they're trying to give you that, except their incentives are to maximize their own revenues. And of course, they optimize for chaos as a result, maybe not intentionally, but it's what ends up happening. Um, whereas if you have a model where uh, you are in control of all of your data and all of your, your information, and you have the application layer on top competing on how they present that information to you, and in such a way that if you don't like how one application is filtering your newsfeed, you can go to the other application, which filters it in a different way, then you have competition at the application layer in terms of how that data is, is, is presented to people. And so you have a much more diverse ecosystem of, you know, let's call them filter bubbles. Um, because right now there's a monopoly on who gets to decide what the filter bubble is for you. But if we uh, open that up and turn it into a market, then we may end up with better outcomes. I'll just make one real quick point here that, uh, you know, there's a, it, it's now obvious to everybody that there is a market failure associated with these data monopolies. And, and a lot of well-meaning people are proposing regulation to manage that market failure. And Joel's made the point earlier that the impact of that will be to entrench the current incumbents and it doesn't really solve the problem that we're trying to solve. And what Joel's suggesting is, um, a reimagining of something like a property right in data which allows the market to work correctly and that's going to end up being a much better solution because we'll allow for um, we'll allow for small companies to emerge and compete effectively with the dominant uh, data monopolies but you know, I don't know if we want to take some questions. I don't know how much time that says we have. We got a minute and a half, so I'm going to ask you guys <laughs> one, one remaining question. That's going to be it. Sorry. Um, you guys just say too many good things. Um, so, and, and I guess layering on one last thing, this is now where I'm becoming a panelist. Um, something that we talk about a lot is reputation um, and the silos of reputation and how it's frustrating to build a reputation on Amazon or eBay or wherever it might be and then have to replicate. Um, and that is really just a, a broken system. Um, so I'm curious where, Joel, I'll start with you, but Brad, I'm curious for your opinion as well. What do you guys expect the protocol versus application interface landscape to look like in number and size, say, 10 years down the line? Well, I think that um, we will end up with a relatively small and, you know, 
relative being the key word, number of protocols servicing a much larger number of applications where um, the, and this is kind of uh, within the, the idea or the framework of FAT protocols, we may have a relatively smaller number of really large scale protocols that have a lot of value captured in them. Long term, they may be mature to the point where that value is generally static and, and not all of that uh, exciting in some ways, kind of like how um, the internet started. There was a lot of activity in chips and routers and then that infrastructure kind of uh, became set and then all the value moved up to the application layer. Um, so what I want to see is I want to see some amount of uh, maturity at the protocol layer and then uh, have all, a lot of competition at the application layer. Um, and um, you know, how we get to that point is kind of an interesting question because there's things like forks and things like that. And is there ever a point where protocols don't need to evolve is, is a, a whole open, open question. But uh, thousands of applications for comparatively fewer protocols is what, what I want to see. I think the most interesting thing we're going to watch over the next uh, five years is the convergence of functionality within protocols because of some effect of composability and liquidity that is way beyond my ability to wrap my head around. But um, I'd like to think that we end up where Joel's, in the world Joel's describing, where we've converged on a, and a set of protocols that basically model human behavior in a way that is efficient and captures, as he says, a lot of the value in the protocol. And then we have a large number of much smaller applications competing on a level playing field on top of that in a much more dynamic and uh, exciting, uh, innovative world. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.